Hello, I'm Bob Brinkmeyer, Director of the Institute for Southern Studies at the University of South Carolina, which is home to the SIMS initiatives. The initiatives are a digital humanities project of the university libraries, funded in part with a generous grant from the Watson Brown Foundation. In celebration of Halloween and to promote our site, we are reading one of SIMS's ghost stories throughout the month of October. The story is called Grayling, or Murder, Will Out, and it is part of the author's short story collection, The Wigwam and the Cabin. At this point in the story, our hero, James Grayling, has just concluded his encounter with the ghost of his friend, Major Spencer. The aftermath of his experience is the subject of part 12 of William Gilmore Sims's Grayling, or Murder Will Out. When I heard all, I burst into a flood of tears, and then I felt strong. I felt that I could talk or fight or do almost anything, and I jumped up to my feet and was just about to run down to where the major stood, but with the first step which I made forward, he was gone. I stopped and looked all around me, but I could see nothing, and the bay was just as black as midnight. But I went down to it and tried to press in where I thought the major had been standing, but I couldn't get far. The brush and bay bushes were so close and thick. I was now bold and strong enough, and I called out loud enough to be heard half a mile. I didn't exactly know what I called for, or what I wanted to learn, or I've forgotten. But I heard nothing more. Then I remembered the camp, and began to fear that something might have happened to mother and uncle, for now I felt, what I had not thought of before, that I had gone too far around the bay to be of much assistance, or, indeed, to be in time for any, had they been suddenly attacked. Besides, I could not think how long I had been gone. But now it seemed very late. The stars were shining their brightest, and the thin white clouds of morning were beginning to rise and run towards the west. Well, I bethought me of my course, for I was a little bewildered and doubtful where I was. But after a little while thinking, I took the back track and soon got a glimpse of the campfire, which was nearly burnt down. And by this I reckoned I was gone considerably longer than my two hours. When I got back to the end of the camp, I looked under the wagon and found Uncle in a sweet sleep. And though my heart was full almost to bursting with what I had heard and the cruel sight I had seen, yet I would not waken him. And I beat about and mended the fire and watched and waited until near daylight when Mother called to me out of the wagon and asked who it was. This wakened my uncle, and then I up and told all that had happened, for if it had been to save my life, I couldn't have kept it in much longer. But though Mother said it was very strange, Uncle Sparkman considered that I had only been dreaming, but he couldn't persuade me of it, and when I told him I intended to be off at daylight, just as the Major had told me to do, and ride my best all the way to Charleston, he laughed and said I was a fool. But I felt that I was no fool, and I was solemn certain that I hadn't been dreaming. And though both mother and he tried their hardest to make me put off going, yet I had made up my mind to do it, and they, gave, they had to give up. For wouldn't I have been a pretty sort of friend to the Major if, after what he told me, I could have stayed behind and gone on only at a wagon pace to look after the murder? I don't think if I had done so that I should ever have been able to look at a white man in the face again. Soon as the peep of day, I was on horseback. Mother was mighty sad and begged me not to go, but Uncle Sparkman was mighty sulky, and he kept calling me a fool upon fool until I was almost angry enough to forget that we were a blood kin. But all of this talking did not stop me, and I reckon I was five miles away before he, he had his team in traces for a start. I rode as briskly as I could get on without hurting my nag. I had a smart ride of more than 40 miles before me, and the road was very heavy. But it was a good two hours from sunset when I got into town, and the first question I asked of people I met was to show me where the ships were kept. When I got to the wharf, they showed me the foul mouth packet, where she lay in the stream, ready to sail as soon as the wind should favor. This has been part 12 of William Gilmore Sims's Grayling, or Murder Will Out. I hope you will tune in next time for another section of this gothic tale. 
If you'd like to read the full text of this story, or any of the many other works we have available, simply visit the SIMS Initiative's website at sims.library.sc.edu. Until then, Happy Halloween.